second alcibiades by plato translated by george burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards persons of the dialogue socrates alcibiades socrates are you going alcibiades to pray to the god alcibiades just so socrates socrates you appear to have a serious look and to be directing your eyes to the ground as if thinking upon something alcibiades of what should a person be thinking socrates socrates of things alcibiades of the greatest moment as it seems to myself at least for come by zeus do you not think when we happen to pray either in private or in public that the gods themselves sometimes grant some of those prayers and some not and to some persons they not assent but to some not alcibiades very much so socrates does it not seem then to you that there is need of much forethought in order that a person may not unconsciously pray for great evils for himself while thinking he is praying for good and that the gods may not happen to be in such a disposition as to grant whatever he happens to be praying for just as they say oedipus did in praying that his sons might divide their patrimony by the sword and when he might have prayed for his then present evils to be averted he uttered a curse that others might be superadded and thereupon both these were brought to pass and after these others too many and terrible of which what need is there to speak singly alcibiades but socrates you have spoken of a man who was mad for who think you of sound mind would venture to make such a prayer socrates does it seem to you that to be mad is at all the contrary to being in one's senses alcibiades perfectly so socrates do not men seem to you to be senseless and sensible alcibiades yes to be so socrates come then let us consider who these are for that there are men senseless and sensible you have admitted and others who are mad alcibiades it has been admitted socrates moreover there are some men in a sound state of health alcibiades there are socrates and are there not others in a bad state of health alcibiades certainly socrates these are not the same with those alcibiades they are not socrates are there not others who are in neither of those states alcibiades certainly not socrates for every man must of necessity be either in a diseased state or not alcibiades it seems so to myself at least socrates what then with respect to intellect and non-intellect have you the same opinion alcibiades how say you socrates does it seem to you to be necessary for a man to be sensible or senseless or is there some third and middle state which causes a man to be neither sensible nor senseless alcibiades there certainly is not socrates it is necessary then for him to be in the one or in the other of those states alcibiades so it seems to me at least socrates do you not remember that you admitted this that insanity is contrary to being in one's senses alcibiades i do socrates and that there is no middle or third state which causes a man to be neither sensible nor senseless alcibiades i admitted this too socrates but how can two different things be contrary to one thing alcibiades by no means socrates to be senseless then and to be mad seem to be nearly the same thing alcibiades they seem so socrates if then we should pronounce that all fools were madmen we should pronounce rightly alcibiades for example if some of your equals in age happen to be senseless as indeed they are and some of your elders likewise come by jove do you not think that in this city there are few sensible men but the majority senseless whom you call madmen alcibiades yes i do socrates think you then 
that living under the same state with so many madmen we should be delighted or that we should not be buffeted and pelted and have long since suffered punishment for such acts as madmen are wont to commit but consider thou blessed man whether this be the case alcibiades what then could it be socrates for it appears nearly to be not what i just now fancied socrates neither does it appear so to myself but let us look at the matter in some such way as this alcibiades in what way do you mean socrates i will tell you we understand that some men are in bad health do we not alcibiades certainly socrates does it seem to you necessary for every man in bad health to have the gout or a fever or ophthalmia or does it not seem to you that a man without suffering at all in this way may be ill in some other disorder for diseases we suppose are of many various kinds and not these alone alcibiades i suppose there are socrates does not every ophthalmia seem to be a disease alcibiades yes socrates but is every disease ophthalmia alcibiades certainly not it seems to me yet still i am at a loss about your meaning socrates if however you will give me your attention by considering the matter both of us together will peradventure discover it alcibiades i am giving you socrates all attention to the best of my power socrates was it not agreed upon by us that every ophthalmia was a disease but every disease was not an ophthalmia alcibiades it was agreed so socrates and it seems to me to have been correctly agreed for all persons in a fever have a disease but not all however who have a disease are in a fever neither have they all i think the gout nor ophthalmia everything indeed of this kind is a disease and they whom we call physicians say that diseases produce different effects for all diseases are not alike nor do they all act similarly but each according to its own peculiar power and yet they are all diseases just as we understand there are in the case of workmen do we not alcibiades certainly socrates such as shoemakers carpenters statuaries and very many others whom why need one mention in detail all these have divided amongst them portions of handicraftship and yet all are handicraftsmen they are not however carpenters nor shoemakers nor statuaries taken altogether alcibiades certainly not socrates just so have men divided folly amongst them and those who have the largest share we call madmen but those who have a less silly and thunderstruck but if we choose to speak of such in good omened language some call them high-spirited but others simpletons and others again harmless and inexperienced and speechless you will also find upon inquiry many other names but they all mean non-intellect although they differ just as one art has been shown by us to differ from another and one disease from another or how does it seem to you alcibiades to me in this way socrates to the point then from whence we digressed let us return back again for it was proposed i think in the beginning of our conversation to consider who are the senseless and sensible for it was agreed that some such existed was it not alcibiades yes it was so agreed socrates whether then do you understand by the sensible those who know how to do and say what they ought alcibiades i do socrates and whom do you understand by the senseless are they not such as know neither of those things alcibiades those very persons socrates will not those persons then who know neither of those things unconsciously say and do what they ought alcibiades it appears so socrates now of these very persons alcibiades oedipus i said was one and you will find many of those living even now who though not influenced by anger as he was pray for things hurtful to themselves 
not fancying them to be so, but good rather. He indeed, as he did not pray for good, so neither did he fancy he was doing so, but some others there are who have suffered the very contrary to this. For I think that you, if the God to whom you happen to be going, should appear to you, and, before you had uttered a prayer, first ask you, will it suffice for you to become a despotic king of Athens? And if you thought this a trifle, and no great thing should add, and over all the Greeks, and if he should see that you fancied you would still have too little, unless he were to appoint you king of the whole of Europe, and should undertake not this alone, but that on this very day, according to your wish, all should perceive that Alcibiades, the son of Cleinias, is their autocrat, I think you would walk away exceedingly delighted, as if you had met with the greatest good. Alcibiades, I fancy, Socrates, that any one else whatever would do so likewise, if such things were to happen to him. Socrates, you would not, however, be willing that the country of, and absolute dominion over, all the Greeks and barbarians should be yours in exchange for your life. Alcibiades, I suppose not. For why should I, when I was about to make no use of them? Socrates, what then, if you were about to make a bad and detrimental use of them, you would not be willing even in such a case? Alcibiades, certainly not. Socrates, you see then that it is not safe to accept at random gifts when offered, nor for a person to pray that things may take place if he is about to be injured through them, or be totally released from life. Many too we could mention, who, after having longed for absolute power, and laboured to obtain it, as if about to enjoy some mighty good, have, on account of their tyranny, been plotted against, and lost their lives. I think, too, that some events which happened, as it were, but yesterday, have come to your ears. How that a favourite of Archelaus, tyrant of Macedonia, murdered his admirer, through his being as fond of absolute power as the tyrant was of him, and with the view of becoming the tyrant himself, and a happy man, but that, possessing the power for three or four days, he was in turn plotted against by some of his friends, and destroyed. You see, too, of our fellow citizens, for this we have not heard from others, but know by being present ourselves, that such as have longed for, and obtained the command of an army, some are even now exiles from the city, and others have ended their lives, and such as seemed to have fared the best have passed through many trying dangers and terrors during the campaign itself, and when they have returned to their own country have suffered from informers a siege not at all inferior to that which they have endured from foreign foes, so that some of them prayed they had never been at the head of an army rather than to have borne a command. Now, if the dangers and toils had tended to their benefit, it would have had some reason, but now it is quite the reverse, and, with respect to children, you will find, in the very same manner, how that some persons, after having prayed for them to be born, have, when they are born, come into the greatest calamities and sorrows. For some, whose children have been thoroughly wicked, have passed the whole of their lives in sorrow and some whose children were well behaved, have met with the misfortune to be deprived of them, and have come into calamities in no respect less than the others, and, like them, have wished rather that their children had been never born. And yet, although these and many other instances of the like kind are so very evident to persons, it is rare to find a man who would refuse what is offered, or who, if he is about to obtain it by prayer, would cease to pray for it, nor would the majority refrain from absolute power if offered them, or the command of an army, or many other things which, when present, do more harm than good, but they would, on the contrary, pray for their possession, should such things happen not to be present to any one, and yet, after waiting a little time, they sometimes recant and pray the reverse of what they prayed before. I have, therefore, my doubts that men do in reality accuse the gods unjustly in saying that their evils come from them, for either by their own crimes or follies we should say. 
they griefs endure beyond their fated share and that poet alcibiades was near to being a sensible person who when connected with some friends void of understanding and observing them to do and pray for things which it were better for them not to have but which appeared to them to be good thought proper to use in common a prayer which he expresses somehow to this effect o zeus our king whate'er is good vouchsafe to us if prayers we offer or do not but evil when we pray thee to avert do thou ordain to me indeed the poet appears to speak correctly and safely but if you have aught in your mind against this sentiment do not hold your tongue alcibiades it is a difficult matter socrates to speak against anything which is said correctly but i am thinking on that point of how many evils to man is ignorance the cause since as it seems through it we are unconsciously doing to ourselves the greatest mischiefs and what is the worst even praying for them a fact which no one would fancy but every one would conceive this rather that he is competent to pray for things the best for himself and not the worst for this would in reality be like a curse and not a prayer socrates but perhaps o best of men some one who happens to be wiser than you or i would say that we do not speak correctly in blaming thus at random ignorance unless we add that of some things and to some persons and under certain circumstances ignorance is a good as it is to them an evil alcibiades how say you is there anything whatever of which it is better for any person whatever under any circumstances whatever to be ignorant than to know socrates so it seems to me at least and does it not to you alcibiades no by zeus socrates i will not bring a verdict against you on the point of your being willing to do to your own mother what they say orestes and alcmaeon did or whoever else may have happened to act in the same manner as they did alcibiades speak by zeus words of good omen socrates socrates there is no need alcibiades of your bidding that person to speak words of good omen who says that you would not be willing to do such a deed but much rather him who says the contrary but since the deed appears to you to be so dreadful that it ought not to be mentioned so easily do you think that orestes if he had been a sensible person and known what it was best for him to do would have dared to commit any such act alcibiades by no means socrates nor would i think any other man alcibiades certainly not socrates the ignorance therefore of what is best is an evil and to be ignorant of the best alcibiades so it appears at least to me socrates and to him and to all other men alcibiades so i say socrates let us consider further this too if it occurred to you on this very instant to think it were a better thing for you to take a dagger and going to the house of pericles your guardian and your friend to ask is he within with the intention of killing only him and no other person and that the servants should say he is within i do not assert that you have an inclination to do any of these things but if as i think it shall seem good to you which surely nothing prevents that to him who is ignorant of what is the best an opinion has at some time occurred so that what is even the worst has been thought at some time to be the best or does it not seem to you it would be alcibiades certainly so socrates if then upon going within you should see himself there but not knowing him should think he was some other person would you still venture to kill him alcibiades no by zeus i do not think i should socrates for you would not kill any person who happened to meet you but only that very person whom you wish to kill is it not so alcibiades yes socrates and if you made frequent attempts but were always ignorant of his being pericles whenever you were about to do the deed you never would make an attack upon him alcibiades certainly not 
Socrates, what then do you think that Orestes would ever have made an attack upon his mother if in like manner he had not known her? Alcibiades, I think he would not. Socrates, for he too had it not in his mind to kill any woman who might need him, nor the mother of any person whatever, but his own mother. Alcibiades, such is the fact. Socrates, to persons then so situated and having such fancies, it is better not to know such things. Alcibiades, it appears so. Socrates, do you then perceive that of some things and to some persons and under some circumstances ignorance is a good and not as it seemed to you just now an evil alcibiades it is probable socrates further still if you are willing to consider what is after this it would perhaps appear to you to be absurd alcibiades what especially socrates socrates that the possession of all other sciences so to speak is unless a person possesses the science of what is best very near to being seldom a benefit but generally hurtful to the person possessing it and consider in this way does it not seem to you necessary that when we are about to do or say anything we ought to know or previously fancy we know or know in reality what we are about to say or do rather readily alcibiades to me at least it seems so Socrates, do not then our public speakers, either knowing how to counsel or fancying they know, give us their counsel on the instant on every occasion, some about war and peace, others about the building of walls or furnishing harbors, and in one word, whatever one state does to another state or itself by itself, all takes place from the advice of the orators? Alcibiades, you speak the truth. Socrates, see then what is after this. Alcibiades, if I am able. Socrates, you surely call persons sensible and senseless? Alcibiades, I do. Socrates, do you not call the many senseless, but the few sensible? Alcibiades, just so. Socrates, and you call both so, with an eye to something? Alcibiades, yes. Socrates, would you call that man sensible who knows how to give advice, but without knowing whether a thing is better and in what it is better? Alcibiades. Certainly not. Socrates. Nor him, I think, who knows war abstractedly, but without knowing when it is better or for how long a time it is better. Is it not so? Alcibiades. It is. Socrates. Nor if a person knows how to murder another or to take away his property or to cause him to be an exile from his country, without knowing when it is better, or to whom it is better to do so. Alcibiades. Certainly not. Socrates. The man, therefore, who possesses any knowledge of such a kind, unless the knowledge also of what is best follows at his side, now this is surely the same as the knowledge of what is beneficial. Is it not so? Alcibiades. Certainly it is. Socrates shall we say that he is a sensible and a competent counsellor both for the state and himself, but that the man who does not do so is the contrary of these? Or how seems it to you? Alcibiades, to me in this way. Socrates, what then should a person who knows how to ride or shoot with a bow or wrestle or box or engage in any other kind of combat or in anything else which we know by art by what name will you call him who knows what takes place the better according to each art? Will you not call him who knows according to the equestrian art an equestrian? Alcibiades. Yes. Socrates. And him who knows according to the boxing art a boxer? But him according to the hoboy playing art a hoboy player? And in the rest of cases surely analogously to these? Or how otherwise? Alcibiades not otherwise than in this way. Socrates, does it then seem to you necessary that the person, knowing any of these, is a sensible man? Or shall we say that he wants much of being so? Alcibiades, much indeed by Zeus. Socrates, what kind of a commonwealth do you think there would be composed of good bowmen and hoboy players 
and still more of athletes and other artists and of those mixed with such as we have just now mentioned who know how to war in the abstract and to murder in the abstract and moreover of orators puffed up with the statesman's swell but all devoid of the knowledge of what is best and of that which knows when it is better to make use of each one of those things and against whom alcibiades a bad one socrates i think socrates and you would say i think when you saw each one of these men full of ambition and giving the greatest share he has in the commonwealth to that point where he may happen to be best himself i mean that which becomes best according to his own art but of that which is the best for the state and himself for himself having missed for the most part as having i think trusted without intellect to opinion since then such is the case should we not speak correctly in saying that such a commonwealth was full of great disorder and of lawlessness alcibiades right indeed by zeus socrates did it not seem to us to be necessary that we ought previously to fancy we know or to know in reality what we are about to say or do readily alcibiades it seems so socrates should then a person do what he knows or thinks he knows and there follow that we have ourselves beneficially and profitably both to the state and himself to himself is not alcibiades how not socrates but if he does i think the contrary of these there will be a benefit neither to the public nor himself alcibiades certainly not socrates what then does it seem to you now in the like manner or somehow otherwise alcibiades not otherwise than this socrates did you not say that you called the many senseless but the few sensible alcibiades i did socrates and do we not say again that the many have missed of what is the best by having generally i think trusted to opinion without intellect alcibiades we say it socrates it is for the interest then of the many neither to know anything nor to fancy they know if they shall be more ready to do what they know or fancy they know and by doing so are about to be still more injured than benefited alcibiades you say what is most true socrates do you see then that when i said that the possession of the other sciences is unless a person possesses the science of what is best very near to being seldom beneficial and generally hurtful to the person possessing it did i not appear to be speaking in reality correctly alcibiades if not then yet now it seems so socrates socrates it is requisite then for a state and a soul that is about to live correctly to cling to this science just as a person in sickness does to a physician or a person about to sail in safety does to a steersman by so much as the soul may not previously have a favourable wind either respecting the possession of property or the strength of body or anything else of such a kind by so much the greater errors is it necessary it seems to arise from them and he who possesses what is called much learning and much art but is destitute of this very science and is carried along by each of the others will he not in reality justly encounter a violent storm inasmuch as he is i think continuing at sea without a steersman a time not long life of gods so that it seems to me that here too suits the sentiment of the poet which he expresses while he is bringing a charge against some one that trades many knew he but knew badly all alcibiades but how socrates does the verse of this poet suit here for to me it seems to say nothing to the purpose socrates nay it is very much to the purpose but this poet writes enigmatically and so do nearly all the others for the whole of poetry is naturally enigmatical and it is not for a person who is to be met with anywhere to understand it and in addition to its being such naturally when it seizes upon a man of a grudging disposition and unwilling to make himself known 
but desirous to conceal as much as possible his wisdom, it seems to be difficult beyond measure to understand what each of those poets mean. For you cannot surely think that Homer, a poet most divine and clever, was ignorant how impossible it is for a person to know a thing badly. For he it is who says that Margites knew many things, but knew all badly. But he speaks enigmatically, I suppose, by introducing the word badly instead of the word bad, and he knew instead of to know. There is then a sentence composed, unshackled by the meter, and it expresses what he meant, that he knew many trades, but that to know all was to him an evil. It is evident, then, that if to know many things was to him an evil, he himself was some worthless fellow, at least if we must give any credit to the reasonings previously produced. Alcibiades, and so it seems, Socrates, to me, for I should hardly give credit to other reasonings if not to these. Socrates, and correctly does it seem so. Alcibiades, again, it seems to me. Socrates, but come by Zeus, for you surely see how great and of what kind is the difficulty and doubt in which you two appear to me to have a share, as you never rest at all in changing your place up and down. But what may have seemed especially to you, this to have gone secretly away again, and so seems no longer in a similar manner. Should the god, then, to whom you happen to be going, appear to you even now, and ask you, before you had prayed for anything whatever, whether it would be sufficient for you, if any of those things mentioned at the beginning were to take place, or should he leave it to yourself to make a request, how, think you, could you avail yourself of the opportunity? Either by accepting any of the things offered, or by praying yourself for something to happen. Alcibiades, now, by the god Socrates, I should not know what to say in such a case, but it seems to me to be a violent thing, and in good truth one of caution, in order that a person may not unconsciously pray for things evil, while fancying them to be good, and then, after waiting, as you said, a little time, recant, and pray the reverse to what he did at first. Socrates, did not then the poet, whom I mentioned at the beginning of the argument, know somewhat more than we do, when he begged of Zeus to avert terrible things from us when praying? Alcibiades. So it seems to me. Socrates. The Lacedaemonians, therefore, Alcibiades, having admired this very poet, or having so considered themselves the matter, put up on every occasion, in private and in public, a similar prayer, by requesting the gods to grant them ever things honourable in addition to what are good, and no one has ever heard them pray for anything more. Accordingly, up to the passing time, they have been fortunate less than none, and even if it has happened to them to be not fortunate in everything, it was not on account of this prayer of theirs, but it is for the gods, I presume, to grant what a person happens to pray for, and the reverse. And I am desirous of telling you something else, which I once heard from certain elderly persons, how that, when differences arose between the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians, it so happened to our city that whenever there was a battle, by land or sea, it was unsuccessful, and never able to gain a victory. Thereupon the Athenians, brooking ill their doings, and at a loss for some contrivance to find an escape from their present evils, held a council, and it seemed to them that it would be best to send to Ammon and inquire of him, and in addition this too likewise. On what account do the gods always give the victory to the Lacedaemonians rather than to us, who of all the Greeks bring them sacrifices the most numerous and the most beautiful, and have decorated their temples with offerings such as none else have done, and are wont to make to the gods processions the most costly and the most solemn each year, and to expend money such as all the rest of the Greeks never did together whereas the Lacedaemonians have never paid the least regard to any of these things, but conduct themselves in so slighting a manner towards the gods as to sacrifice on each occasion animals, maimed even, and in all other matters fall far short of us, not a little in honouring the gods, 
although possessing property not less than our state. When the messenger had thus spoken, and had inquired of the oracle what they ought to do to find a deliverance from their present evils, the prophet made no other answer, for it is evident that God did not permit him, but calling the messengers, said, To the Athenians, thus saith Ammon, he saith, that he prefers the good omened address of the Lacedaemonians before all the sacrifices of the rest of the Greeks. These words he said, and nothing more. Now it seems to me that by a good omened address the god means only that prayer of theirs, for it is in reality much superior to the prayers of others. For the rest of the Greeks are wont, some of them, after placing by the altar oxen with gilded horns, and others presenting the gods with offerings to be hung up in temples, to pray for whatever they happen to desire, whether it be good or evil. The gods, therefore, on hearing their impious addresses, accept not their costly processions and sacrifices, so that there is need of much caution and consideration as to what is to be spoken and not. And you will find in Homer likewise other expressions similar to these. For he says that the Trojans, on taking up their night quarters, the perfect hecatombs to the immortal gods gave, and that the winds carried the savour of the fat to heaven. Sweet smelling, but the blessed gods refused to taste it, for by them was hated much the holy Ilion and Priam too, and of the careful Priam subjects all so that it was of no use for them to sacrifice or to expend presents in vain when they were thus hated by the gods. For the divine nature, I conceive, is not such as to be seduced by presents, like a knavish judge, but we are giving a silly reason if we think to get the better of the Lacedaemonians in this way, for it would be a dreadful thing indeed if the gods looked to gifts and sacrifices, and not the soul, should a person happen to be holy and just. Nay, they look much more, I think, to this, than to expensive processions and sacrifices, for which there is nothing to prevent those from having the power to pay each year either individuals or states who have sinned greatly against the gods, and greatly too against men. But they, as not receiving bribes, disdain all such things as these, as says the god, and to the prophet of the gods. It seems, then, that justice and prudence are near to being honoured above all things by the gods, and by men too, that have any sense. Now the sensible and the just are none other than such as know what it is meet to do, and say, both towards gods and men. But I should be glad to hear from you what are your thoughts upon this subject. Alcibiades, to myself, Socrates, the matter seems to be in no other way than it does to you and the god, for it would not be reasonable for me to vote contrary to the god. Socrates, do you not remember then saying that you were much at a loss, lest you should unconsciously be praying for evil things, fancying them to be good? Alcibiades, I do. Socrates, you see then that it is not safe for you to go to the god with the view of praying, in order that, should it so happen, he may not hear you speaking impiously, and receive no part of your sacrifice, and you perchance meet with something different. It seems to me, therefore, that it is best to keep quiet, for through your high spirit, for that is the fairest of names for folly, I think he would not be willing to make use of the Lacedaemonian prayer. It is necessary, therefore, for a man to wait until he has learnt how he ought to conduct himself towards gods and men. Alcibiades. But when, Socrates, will that time be? And who is he that will instruct me? For I should be very glad, I think, to see who the man is. Socrates. It is he of whose care you are the object. But it seems to me, as Homer says of Minerva, that she removed the mist from before the eyes of Diomed, that he might clearly see both gods and men. So must he, in the first place, remove from your soul the mist that now happens to be present there, and then apply those things through which you will be about to know both good and evil, for now you seem to be unable to do so. Alcibiades. 
let him then remove the mist or anything else that he pleases as i am prepared not to fly from anything ordered by him whoever he may be if i am about to become a better man socrates and yet he has a very wonderful eagerness in your behalf alcibiades till that time then it seems to me to be best to put off my sacrifice socrates and rightly it seems so to you for it is safer than to run so great a risk alcibiades but how socrates however since you seem to me to have given good advice i will put this garland round your brows and to the gods we will then present crowns and all the other customary offerings when i behold that day arrive and it will in no long time arrive if they are willing socrates well i accept both this and i would see myself readily accepting anything else given by you and as creon when he sees tiresias wearing garlands and hears that he had obtained them as the first fruits of spoils taken from the enemy is made by euripides to say this crown as a happy omen have i worn for well you know how tempest-tossed we lie so do i place on myself this opinion on your part as an omen of good for i seem to myself to be in no less a storm than creon and i would gladly be a victor over your admirers End of second alcibiades